Well, I would love to welcome you all here tonight, those of you who are in the audience. Does that sound good to you? That's a little bouncy. Okay. Um, and our robust online audience, and actually we have C-SPAN here taping as well, so people will be calling me three years from now at 7 o'clock in the morning saying, I was up late last night and I saw you on television. Um, they're going to say that to John as well. So this will live on forever. Um, so. Before I introduce um, tonight's speaker, John Gilbert McCurdy, I just wanted to give you a few updates about things that are going on in the museum, things that are coming up in the museum. First of all, to direct your attention to a special installation uh, that's down on the uh, second floor of the museum, looking at um, uh, the Baron de Steuben, the Baron von Steuben, or Baron Steuben, depending upon who was writing in the period. A wonderful assemblage of um, pieces from the museum's collection on loan to us from private collectors, as well as the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, who have loaned us this wartime portrait by Charles Wilson Peale of um, Baron Steuben. Uh, that's on display um, through the fall here at the museum. In conjunction with the Steuben exhibition, we are really excited to be featuring the work of a contemporary Philadelphia artist, John Wind, his installation called Whiskey Rebellion, which is trying to bridge the 18th century to uh, the present day, and um, through a really incredible um, assemblage of pieces that, are, that start as I guess you'd call them bicentennial and pre-bicentennial whiskey decanters. I remember these from my childhood, actually, uh, that were produced by Jim Beam and other, other distillers um, featuring revolutionary figures from Betsy Ross to Patrick Henry to Baron Steuben himself. And that's on display for Pride Month here uh, during the month of June. And if any of you who are watching online or any of you in the audience are interested in a deeper dive with the artist, John's going to be here on June 22nd to do uh, kind of an artist talk about, about the work. So we're extremely excited about that. Um, through the end of the year, actually through January 5th, our special exhibition, Witness to Revolution, The Unlikely Travels of George Washington's Tent, is in the Patriots Gallery, the Special Exhibitions Gallery here at the museum. If you have been to the museum and you have been moved as anyone whose heart is not made of stone has been <laughs> by the story of Washington's war tent, imagine that two-century story of the, the remarkable life of that object, not just during the Revolutionary War, as really the first Oval Office of our first Commander-in-Chief, but the remarkable story, the incredible diverse cast of people who were responsible for preserving it and creating memories around it, that is now a 5,000 square foot special exhibit. There are objects that are brought together that literally last saw one another when Martha Washington died in 1802. So this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to really see that story um, out on display in a remarkable installation. If you are interested in getting closer to curators at the museum, you love collections, you'd like to support the work that the museum does to continue to grow and steward its collection, I'd love to make a pitch for you to join our collection society. This is kind of an expansion pack for those who are members of the museum that um, uh, creates a fund that allows us to acquire and add objects to the museum. But most important, we have a lot of fun. We get together, you get the first glimpse at objects that uh, have entered the collection. Um, or you know, special uh, opportunities to talk to conservators, historians, curators, to visit private collections. And on June 11th, Virginia Whalen, our good friend, uh, textile conservator, she is the one who literally conserved George Washington's tent that you see on display at the museum, will be doing a special uh, collections uh, society um, visit here uh, to the museum talking about that great project. Um, just a little hint of what's coming next year. I'm really excited about our next special exhibition. It will open on April 19th of 2025. That is the 250th anniversary of the shots heard around the world. This is really, we're talk, we talk about 2026 as the 250th and that's the declaration, but let's remember there was a good long year and a bit of fighting that took place before that. And so the 250th of our nation's birth actually begins next year. And so on April 19th, 
also the eighth anniversary of the Museum of the American Revolution, we will open Banners of Liberty. This is an exhibition of original Revolutionary War flags. Now, there are only about 30 surviving American flags used by uh, revolutionary forces. We are gonna have at least half of them in the room downstairs. Um, if you are 100 years old, you have not been in the presence of this many original flags. If you are born today and live 100 years, or if remarkably you live another 100 years on top of those you've already accrued, you are not gonna have an opportunity like this. This is like the King's Tut exhibit of the Revolutionary War that will be here on display. So super excited about that. Also, our speaker series, of course, Read the Revolution is wrapping up tonight for, for last season, but our fall lecture series will begin on Thursday, September 19th with our annual Carl M. Buchholz Memorial Lecture. We'll be welcoming Dr. Richard Haas, who will be speaking about his book, Bill, uh, The Bill of Obligations, The Ten Habits of Good Citizens. So be looking for opportunities to get uh, tickets there. We are still looking for sponsors. I thank you, Martha McGeary Snyder, one of our first to sign aboard. And so uh, if any of you are connected to corporations or just, you know, move to do a little sponsorship. We'd love to talk with you. Um, so I wanted to, I, when I woke up this morning, um, I was reflecting, as I always do, on June 6th um, about the anniversary. Of course, this is the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Um, during a conflict in which 16 million Americans served in uniform, 290,000 killed, 670,000 wounded, and I wanted some way to sort of bring that into my comments this morning um, because it is a um, perhaps the last major commemoration of D-Day in which there will actually be living veterans uh, who are present there. Um, we talk a lot about the passing of the revolutionary generation that took place in the years, decades leading up to the Civil War as the sort of America's first greatest generation. Um, and I was trying to figure out, well, how can I connect D-Day and the Second World War to tonight's talk and to the Museum of the American Revolution? Um, so let me know how I do. On the left is an object from our collection. This is um, a World War II poster meant to inspire patriotism for people to enlist, to get behind the war effort, uh, to buy war bonds. Um, 1778, of course, was the year of the Valley Forge encampment. 1943, uh, Americans will always fight for liberty. Now, one of the objects uh, that I sort of inherited when I started to work on this project that became the Museum of the American Revolution in 2007 was a flag known as the Commander-in-Chief's Standard. It is a flag that descended in um, Washington's family through descendants of his sister, Betty Washington Lewis, with a history of it having been used to mark Washington's presence in camp and on the field. And you can see it fluttering over those soldiers uh, in the background there. It's a 13 star, you know, blue field, white stars, white six pointed stars. And I always admired this poster. I mean, back to when I was a kid interested in reading about the Second World War. So as I did a little bit of research, I found out that the artist's name was Bernard Perlin. And Google is an amazing thing. I ran across a newspaper article that was an interview with him, and I was like, he's alive. So I, he was living in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Um, so in late in 2008, early 2009, I reached out to him. I spoke with him on the phone a couple times. We exchanged um, letters back and forth. I was interested in, you know, this flag was not really well known at the time. It was here, you know, as part of our collection displayed out at Valley Forge. But I was like, do you remember anything about how this painting came together that became this, you know, widely distributed poster? And he said, well, I got, he remembered the names of all the GIs that he had used as, uh, as models. But he said, somebody handed me like a folder of historical research. So that was kind of a dead end. But what I learned in talking with him is his remarkable personal history. Bernard Perlin, who was born in 1918 in Richmond, Virginia, to Russian Jewish um, parents, immigrants. Um, as a child, he had a great uh, artistic um, facility. He studied at the New York School of Design, the National Academy of Design. 
Remarkably, in 1938, he received a Kosciuszko Foundation Award to study in Poland a year before the German and Soviet invasion of Poland. He's studying art in Poland as a Russian Jew, right? Comes back to America. He was rejected for military service at the beginning of the Second World War because he was openly gay. And so he served as an artist in the Office of War Inf Information, 1942, 1943. That's when he produced this work and a number of other. If you go to the World War II Museum uh, in, in uh, New Orleans and you see the display of all those World War II uh, inspiring posters, a lot of that work was done by um, Bernard Perlin. He then went on to be an artist correspondent for Life and Fortune magazines. Uh, he was in Europe, he was in Asia, he was in the South Pacific, so he really saw um, up front uh, quite a bit of the suffering and recorded that as an artist and correspondent during the Second World War. Um, in 2009, at just the time when we were corresponding, he married his partner, Edward Newell, of 54 years. Um, and I remember him sort of talking on the phone about this. And um, he died in Ridge, Ridgefield, Connecticut in uh, 2014 at age 95. And so I really treasure that I, I've got these letters uh, that we exchanged. He invited me up to visit him. And I have a great regret that I never went up and actually had a chance to sit with him. But I just thought as we were reflecting on the subject of tonight's talk, how many conflicts have stories that were not, you know, have not been told. And that is the subject, of course, that is near and dear to the heart of this museum. It has been baked into the DNA of this place uh, since we opened. And um, I am so excited to introduce then our speaker tonight, uh, John Gilbert McCurdy. I'm going to torture you with his bio just because it's so impressive. Um, Dr. McCurdy is professor of history at Eastern Michigan University, where he's taught since 2005. Uh, he's been nominated for many teaching awards. It's no surprise when you hear him uh, speak tonight because he's so engaging and received the Faculty Scholarship Award in 2010. He teaches courses in colonial, revolutionary America, as well as LBGTQ plus history. Uh, and tonight he's, of course, um, here to speak about his third book, which is titled Vicious and Immoral uh, Homosexuality, The American Revolution and the Trials of Robert Newberg, which was published just this week. This is literally the book launch tonight, uh, and that's published by Johns Hopkins University Press. He's also the author of Quarters, The Accommodation of the British Army and the coming of the American Revolution. And those, are, of course, are both available to purchase and have signed this evening, for those of you who are joining us in, in, in person. Uh, and that was named 2019 Book of the Year by the Journal of the American Revolution. Um, I also, his first book was called Citizen Bachelors, Manhood and the Creation of the United States. He's written numerous articles. He received his PhD from Washington University in St. Louis and has a PA, uh, sorry, an MA from the University of Chicago, a BA from Knox College. And uh, we are delighted to have you back in Philadelphia tonight, Professor McCurdy, and look forward to a scintillating exploration of this important topic. So please. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I want to thank the Museum of the American Revolution for the incredible opportunity to speak here uh, today. I'm especially grateful for the leadership of Scott Stevenson uh, and the hard work of Hannah Botcher, Beth Ann Downey, and Tyler Putman. Uh, I also want to recognize that two of my colleagues from Eastern Michigan University are here this evening, uh, James Eggy and Mary Elizabeth Murphy, uh, as well as a uh, recent graduate of Eastern Michigan University, Joseph Conley. Uh, finally, I'm touched that several dear friends are here today. Uh, Arun Mather, George Boudreaux, and Sandy Slater. How did people think about homosexuality in revolutionary America? What did they think about it? These seemingly simple questions are actually very difficult to answer. For the last 60 years, historians have detailed the diversity of our nation's founders. As the exhibits in this museum testify, we now know that issues of race, gender, religion, even class affected the creation of the United States. But we don't know much about LGBTQ plus people in the revolution. 
Now, part of the problem is an evolving notion of sexual identity. While people of the same sex have always been intimate, the understanding of such intimacies has changed considerably over time. For example, the term homosexual was not invented until nearly a century after the revolution, while terms like sodomy and buggery often referred to acts rather than identities. Another problem is that we have limited sources. Unlike earlier eras, there are only scraps of evidence to understand same-sex intimacy in the 18th century. For the revolution, probably the best examples are U.S. Army Lieutenant uh, Frederick Enslin, who was court-martialed for attempting to commit sodomy with another soldier, and Baron von Steuben, who we've heard about, the Prussian officer who trained the Continentals uh, in part because he was here uh, in America because he had been forced to flee his homeland because he had taken familiarities with young boys. These examples are frustratingly curt. They tell us very little about how people in revolutionary America thought about homosexuality and nothing about how these men saw themselves. Moreover, they offer little insight into how the war for independence affected or was affected by sexuality. In contrast, the more we have studied African Americans, women, and others in the revolution, the more we have come to appreciate how the independence movement radicalized these groups and laid the foundation for a more inclusive notion of citizenship. Calls for freedom from the enslaved gave rise to abolitionism, while the insistence that the founders remember the ladies led to the first feminist tracts in American history. Might the revolution have also had a radical effect on men who had sex with men? And if so, was there a legacy of this inclusion? I've been researching the American Revolution for about a quarter century now, and so I know, now, know that these are very difficult questions to answer. When I first began my dissertation, I tried to get at these questions indirectly by studying single men. I initially thought that the laws and other strictures placed on bachelors in the colonial era reflected a desire to punish sodomites. But through my research, I found that this was not the case. As I detail in my book, Citizen Bachelors, Manhood and the Creation of the United States, most bachelors were straight. Uh, indeed, it was men who fathered children out of wedlock that most concerned lawmakers and social commentators. Fears of men sodomizing each other was at best an afterthought. Accordingly, I dispensed with issues of sexuality uh, when it came time to write another book. Instead of looking for men who had sex with men, I turned my attention toward other aspects of the American Revolution. The university I teach at is just down the road from the William L. Clements Library in Ann Arbor, uh, which is one of the great repositories of early American history. The Clements holds the papers of General Thomas Gage, who served as commander-in-chief of the British Army in North America from 1763 to 1775. These letters are beautifully preserved and very easy to read, as long as you can decipher cursive. I read through the Gage papers and discovered that the general was preoccupied with quartering, that is, where to house British soldiers in the American colonies. Placing redcoats in private homes raised several uncomfortable uh, constitutional and political questions that helped bring about American independence. In the book that followed, Quarters, the Accommodation of the British Army and the Coming of the American Revolution, I argued that the debates about where to house soldiers evoked a hearty discussion about the meaning of place and that Americans' opinions on quartering had a profound effect on the United States. It was while reading through the Gage papers that I discovered the trials of Robert Newberg. At first, I skimmed the transcript. It didn't have much to do with quartering, and so I set it aside. After I finished quarters, I returned to the Clements, thinking that the case might make a good article. Uh, but then I realized I'd only found the tip of the iceberg. The transcript in Ann Arbor was but one of several legal actions involving Robert Newberg. I discovered six more cases at the UK National Archives at Kew. Nearly every, unlike nearly every other source from this era, these transcripts and their supporting documents are dripping with detail. We actually get to hear what people thought about men who had sex with men, and we have an opportunity to, opportunity to think about how a man accused of same-sex intimacy negotiated this world. Moreover, the trials took place in Philadelphia and New York City less than a year before the revolution began, and several men involved in the trials fought in the war for independence. More importantly, the rhetoric and ideology of the revolution seeps through the testimony. The enemies of Robert Newberg feared that his buggery threatened to bring down the British Empire, while he and his defenders utilized a language of rights and equality uh, that was much closer to the words of the American founders than the British Army. Vicious and immoral, homosexuality, the American Revolution, and the trials of Robert Newberg is the result of this investigation. 
In my talk today, I want to give an overview of the book and discuss what the trials of Robert Newbrick can tell us about homosexuality and the American Revolution. I believe, I believe that these cases can help us understand how people thought about homosexuality in revolutionary America and what they thought about it. Before I begin, I want to warn you about a couple of things. Uh, the trials of Robert Newbrick are an imperfect data set. They cover only a small number of people in a short period of time. These documents detail male-male intimacy, but there is little concern for lesbianism, bisexuality, or transgender issues. Although women and African Americans appear occasionally, nearly every voice recorded is white and male. I also don't have pictures of the principal people involved in these cases, which I want to acknowledge before I start showing you pictures. <laughs> Despite these limita limitations, I believe that Newberg's trials indicate that homosexuality was widely understood in the era of the revolution in ways not that dissimilar from our own, and that through his arguments, Robert Newberg laid out better than anyone else the case for sexual liberalism in the nation that followed. Not a picture of Robert Newberg. I'm just going to state that right here. <laughs> to understand the trials of Robert Newberg, we first have to start with the man himself. Robert Newberg was born in 1742 near Dublin, Ireland. His parents were Protestants, and they descended from the English planters that remade the island into an English colony. Robert grew up with the privileges of an elite background. He was skilled at horse riding, spoke Latin, and studied with a private tutor. At 16, he entered Trinity College and took his bachelor's degree four years later. Upon completing his education, Robert Newberg became a priest. He had been raised in the Anglican tradition, and he took holy orders in the Church of Ireland, a Protestant denomination that was the Irish branch of the Church of England. Upon his ordination, Newberg became a traveling parson, serving in several curacies, or temporary appointments, across Ireland. Three years later, he entered the British Army as a chaplain. He purchased a commission in the 18th Regiment of Foot, also known as the Royal Irish Regiment. In May 1773, Robert Newberg made his way to Cork, on the southern coast of Ireland, to seek passage to America. The 18th Regiment was then stationed in Philadelphia, and the regiment's colonel was insistent that the new chaplain join his unit as soon as possible. However, before he could depart, Newberg received a most disquieting letter. I am unfortunately acquainted with some parts of your character, the letter began, which render you a very improper person to act as chaplain to a regiment I highly honor. According to the letter, several former and current British Army officers had testified that Newberg was guilty of a most horrid and unnatural crime, particularly with your own manservant whom you slept with. The man who wrote the letter was Thomas Batt, formerly a captain in the 18th Regiment. Batt had recently retired from military service and was in Ireland procuring uh, alcohol for a wine shop he would later open in Philadelphia. During his time in Ireland, Batt heard rumors about Newberg's sexual relations with his servant. In Batt's opinion, Newberg's uh, actions disqualified him from the army. So what was Robert Newberg accused of doing? According to one testimony, when Newberg was a traveling priest, he rented a room in the Irish town of Sligo. He brought his valet with him, and a separate bed was placed in his chambers for his servant boy. However, the landlady did notice and remark that the said pallet bed was unspoiled, meaning that the servant's bed was not used or slept on. In other words, the two men had slept together. Now, to be sure, it was not unusual for two men to share a bed in the 18th century. But those who saw Newberg and his servant interact reported that the boy was very free with the priest, much more so than was typical of master-servant relations. One observer noted that the two men quarreled like an old married couple, and that Newberg always kept his own servant remarkably neat. The story of Newberg and his servant spread across Ireland and remained a topic of gossip four years later. In fact, Thomas Batt did not seek out this information, rather he came upon it in casual conversation. A short time before I sold out of the regiment, Batt later testified, he was in the company of a number of gentlemen who asked him if he knew about the new chaplain of the 18th regiment. When Batt replied that he did not, they then laughed at me a good deal, and they said I should soon know him, for that the first opportunity he would be into my beef. In short, many told me he was a notorious buggerer. This story troubled Thomas Batt, so he investigated the rumors, and soon he corroborated them. In Cork, Batt met a ship's captain 
who, about the sail for, for America. Robert Newberg also sought passage on the ship, but the captain had refused to carry him to Philadelphia. As the captain told Thomas Batt, if he took Mr. Newberg to sea with him, that Mr. Newberg would cruise up his gut. The language used to describe the chaplain's sexual activities is revealing. Gut was a euphemism for rectum, while beef referred to the stocky part of a man's body, such as his backside. Now, historians have argued that in the 18th century, sodomy was a confused category that encompassed a variety of acts. But Bat spoke specifically of anal sex in his account of Newberg's sexual activities. He also perceived the priest to be the active partner in intercourse, which is not surprising given that his lover was his servant. Perhaps most revealing, Bat thought that Newberg's actions were not confined to one man. Rather, he lusted to penetrate any man, even him. For Bat, it was not what Newberg had done, it was what he desired to do in the future. When he named the chaplain a notorious buggerer, he was describing not just acts, but a rudimentary sexual identity. Robert Newberg was mortified by Thomas Batt's claims. In subsequent testimony, he admitted that he had indeed slept with his servant in Sligo. But this was innocent, Newberg insisted. He had grown up with the servant, and the two men had frequently slept together in the same bed because Robert Newberg was often ill. But such an explanation did very little to calm Batt's fears. In the 18th century, homoerotic desire was often to be believed to be the result of a nervous condition such that Newberg's admission of illness only confirmed his penchant for buggery. In June 1773, Robert Newberg departed for America. His chronic illness impeded his travel such that, he, such that he did not reach Philadelphia until September. Thomas Batt preceded him by a month, meaning that by the time Newberg joined his regiment, everyone had heard the rumors of his sexual activities. In the fall of 1773, Robert Newberg began his duties as chaplain to the 18th Regiment. He delivered Sunday sermons, celebrated the Eucharist, and read funeral services for soldiers who had died. Despite the rumors, most of the Royal Irish treated him with respect. He even became close friends with two officers, Lieutenant Alexander Fowler and Ensign Nicholas Trist. Trist later testified that they have a club amongst themselves on every Monday night at which they talked about religion, science, and history. But not everyone was pleased to have a reputed buggerer in his midst. Probably no member of the 18th Regiment proved a greater nemesis than Captain Benjamin Chapman. Chapman was an Irish Protestant and a career army officer. He harbored ambitions for promotion and took a hard line against anyone who threatened the reputation of the British Army. Once Chapman heard Bat's story that Newburgh had had sex with his servant, he carefully observed the chaplain until he found proof that he was a buggerer. In November 1773, Captain Chapman was walking with the secretary to the governor of New York. As Chapman and the other man talked, the Reverend Mr. Newberg galloped close by them in a most unbecoming dress. Newberg was on horseback, and his appearance so startled the colonial official that he asked Chapman if he knew whose groom that was. When Chapman explained that it was the regiment's chaplain, the official replied that he was also sorry to see it, for that he looked more like a fashionable groom or jockey than one of that sacred function. The incident so embarrassed Captain Chapman that he vowed never to take any notice of Newberg unless unavoidably compelled to it. As a priest, Robert Newberg was expected to wear drab clothes. Many Anglican clergymen wore black cassocks. But on horseback, Newberg wore a long coat with a red collar, Chapman testified. Nor was his inappropriate attire confined to his horse riding. In Philadelphia, Newberg wore a light-colored coat, leather knickers, and white silk stockings. Such clothes were popular among the elites of the 1770s, and in Chapman's opinion, they made Robert Newberg look like what is now termed a macaroni. The term macaroni appears only once in all the documents of Newberg's trials, but it is perhaps the most revealing. Macaroni originated as a type of food, but by the 1770s had become a term of derision for men deemed inappropriately masculine. A macaroni could be identified by his clothes and deportment, which were ridiculously ostentatious. 
the archetypal, uh, archetypal macaroni, wore spotted or striped clothes, jockey-style printed cotton waistcoats, ridiculous wigs, and a small tri-cornered hat. He also carried a small sword, a watch fob, and a snuff box. Depictions were common, and Chapman later testified he has seen a caricature of such a figure in his travels. A macaroni's effeminacy was a window into his character, which most agreed was despicable. An English author writing in 1773 deplored fribbling hairdressers, boring orators, and London gadabouts as monkey ronies, claiming that luxury had deprived them of their masculinity. Although few connected the macaroni's appearance to sexual desire, some speculated that his effeminacy was predictive of buggery. One caricaturist labeled a macaroni Ganymede, Jupiter's mythical boy lover, and showed him facing the hangman for his crimes. This was how Captain Chapman saw Robert Newberg. His flamboyant attire, the macaroni style, was proof that he desired sex with other men. Chapman was not the only officer to take note of the chaplain's appearance or to worry about how his desires might affect the regiment. When Newberg purchased a new green coat, a, cha a captain remarked that the parson is a buggerer, and everyone in his company laughed. Other officers began to worry about Newberg's intention among the soldiers. A captain ordered his men to stay away from the chaplain, while the quartermaster fretted when Newberg requested a room near the outhouse because it was a site notorious for male-male sexual trysts. It appears that Robert Newberg did not seek out sexual partners once he reached America. Certainly his servant did not accompany him to, into the army. Yet this did not soften the opinions of men like Chapman. It was not what Newberg had done, but who he was. In his initial accusation, Thomas Batt took note of the chaplain's character. And this term resurfaced constantly in assessments of Newberg. Character was synonymous with reputation, but it also had an inner quality that could, be, that could not be disguised. As Chapman and others observed Newberg's appearance and actions, they sought to determine whether his very soul was corrupt. Sexual activity was a manifestation of a man's corrupt character, such that Chapman and Bat could not forgive actions that had occurred before Newberg joined the army. It was not what he had done that disturbed them, but who he was. Historians have argued that in the 18th century, a man's sexual acts were not necessarily predictive of his identity. In colonial America, for example, a man accused of sodomizing another man was often whipped or fined, but most of the time it was not assumed that his character was so different that he would do it again. The case of Robert Newberg suggests that this was not the case by 1773. It was not just that he had committed buggery that aroused concern, it was the fear that Robert Newberg's character was corrupt. In other words, that he was a buggerer. Now the term buggerer derives from Bogomil, which was the name of a 10th century religious sect that was deemed heretical and suspected of sexual depravity, specifically sodomy and bestiality. By the 18th century, however, buggerer was more than just a description of a man who committed buggery. A buggerer had a specific character. He possessed inner qualities that could be observed through his clothes and his actions. Buggerers were dangerous. They were immoral and threatened the divine order. They failed to marry and father children, preying on inferior men instead. They tempted others into depravity, not necessarily for sex, but as pawns that they could manipulate to ruin society. To be sure, a buggerer was not the same thing as a homosexual but there were strong parallels between these two identities. Robert Newberg had to respond to the charges against him. Once Captain Chapman turned against him, no enlisted man would go to him for spiritual guidance. Newberg was a devout Christian who believed it his duty to help the less fortunate, but without the respect of the soldiers, he could not do his job. As Newberg began to complain about his situation, the commanding officer, Major Isaac Hamilton, offered him leave to go home. Because the rumors were confined to Ireland, Hamilton reasoned, Newberg should return home and clear up his reputation there. But Newberg rejected this offer. If he left, he would effectively forfeit his commission and be bereft of a livelihood. So he stayed and fought for his reputation. He insisted that he was not a buggerer. Many accused buggerers slunk away. 
The 18th century was an era of scandal, and the British press was replete with stories of men of the highest rank driven into exile by their base desires. But Robert Newberg did not slink away. He had to silence the rumors that he was a buggerer in order to regain his position. But this was an uphill battle. Nearly everyone saw him as a buggerer, and at some point he conceded the fact and acted accordingly. Newberg began by filing civil suits against his accusers. He sued Thomas Batt in the Court of Common Pleas in Philadelphia County, then filed a case against the captain who had said the parson is a buggerer. He also demanded that the quartermaster be court-martialed for insinuating that his choice of rooms was motivated by prurient interest. But none of these cases altered the consensus that he was a buggerer. If anything, they confirmed that he was a troublemaker who did not belong in the British Army. Accordingly, in the summer of 1774, Robert Newberg demanded a court-martial to clear his name once and for all. Major Hamilton was reluctant to act, so in June, Newberg convinced a soul a soldier, excuse me, to formally accuse him of buggery. In charges filed with the deputy judge advocate, Private Robert Jeff claimed that because Newberg was known to have committed buggery, I think it improper in me as a private soldier to pay him any compliment or call upon him to discharge his duty. With the formal accusation of a sexual crime, the army had to act. It had to organize a general court martial to decide on Newberg's character. In August 1774, two dozen members of the 18th Regiment left Philadelphia and traveled to New York City to see their chaplain court-martialed. Robert Newberg stood accused of vicious and immoral behavior, which broke down into charges of perjury, scandalous and indecent acts, and conduct derogatory from the sacred character with which he is invested. Serving as prosecutor for the Army was Captain Benjamin Chapman whose sour opinion of the chaplain had not improved in the last eight months. Officers from other regiments served as a jury, and Robert Newberg as his own defense attorney. The charges were serious. If convicted, Newberg would be cashiered, that is, expelled from the British Army, with no recompense for his com commission. As he began his case, Captain Chapman announced that the Army would not be prosecuting Newberg for sodomy. Robert Jeff, the soldier who accused Mr. Newberg of sodomy, had since deserted, Chapman told the court. But although Chapman dispensed with acts of buggery, he nevertheless prosecuted Newberg as a buggerer. It had never been about acts for Chapman. Rather, it was the priest's character that made him unfit for the army. Chapman thus proceeded to introduce instances where Newberg had acted disrespectfully toward his superiors, defied military hierarchy, and bore false witness in previous trials. The heart of the Army's case centered around Newberg's relationship with a private soldier. On the third day of the trial, Chapman called Prick Private Nicholas Gaffney and proceeded to elicit from him a tale of how the chaplain had seduced him. In so doing, he used Newberg's reputation as a buggerer to argue that he had manipulated an innocent soldier to bring disorder to the regiment. Now, Nicholas Gaffney was a longtime member of the Royal Irish Regiment, who had grown disgruntled in the service. The year before, he had accused his captain of corruption and demanded that the captain be tried. However, Gaffney was unable to substantiate his charges and subsequently found himself court-martialed. The idea of an enlisted man questioning the character of an officer offended many in the 18th Regiment. It indicated that military hierarchy was being challenged from below as colonists in Philadelphia and New York became increasingly vocal in their questioning of monarchy and imperial rule, such instability within the British Army was deemed particularly troubling. During his trials, Private Gaffney had received legal advice from Robert Newberg. This was initially kept secret from the officers of the regiment, but when the chaplain's involvement was discovered, the officers concluded that Gaffney would not have carried matters to those violent lengths had he not been assisted privately by some miscreant. For many in the Royal Irish, Newberg's assistance of Gaffney proved that the chaplain did not care about the social order and was further proof of his character as a buggerer. At Newberg's court-martial, Private Gaffney was the Army's star witness. 
Captain Chapman called him and elicited testimony that described the two men's relationship as completely inappropriate. According to Gaffney, Newberg arranged meetings in his private chambers. Did Mr. Newberg and he ever drink together, Chapman asked. Yes, frequently, Gaffney replied. The private also testified that the chaplain had given him a snuff box, a feminine article that many associated with macaronis, and that Newberg had told lewd stories in his presence. Gaffney also claimed that at times, Newberg and he, and he had been alone together late at night. He has gone there at 10 o'clock at night, and he, uh, when Mr. Newberg has been in bed, the private told the court. The chaplain, upon seeing him, put on his morning gown and went into the closet to him. Not only had the two been alone in a bedroom after dark, but Newberg had been in a state of undress. Through his questions, Chapman followed the tropes of the popular novels of the era to argue that the chaplain had seduced the private. Newberg invited Gaffney into his private chambers and plied him with alcohol, gifts, and flattery. Gaffney was innocent, simple, and trusting, while Newberg was elite, educated, and manipulative. Everyone knew that Newberg had slept with his servant, and Chapman used this to suggest that he had similar designs on Gaffney. Now, to be sure, Chapman never suggested that Newberg and Gaffney had had sex. But a buggerer's disregard for the natural order was not confined to the physical. Instead of seducing Gaffney into bed, Newberg persuaded him to charge his superiors in order to undermine military hierarchy. Newberg hated the 18th Regiment, Chapman argued, and Gaffney was a mere pawn of his design. Once Chapman concluded his case, it was up to Robert Newberg to offer a defense. He questioned the facts of the Army's case and called his two friends, Lieutenant Fowler and Ensign Trist, to speak to the strength of his character. Newberg asked Fowler whether during their acquaintance he has ever observed him guilty of any immoral or indecent behavior, unbecoming a clergyman and a gentleman, to which Fowler replied, he never did. He always found Mr. Newberg's company polite, agreeable, and edifying. Trist offered a similarly gl gl glowing appraisal of the chaplain's character. In effect, both men argued that because Newberg had such a stellar character, he could not be a buggerer. The sanguine opinions of Fowler and Trist toward Newberg stemmed from their own characters. Both men stood apart from the rest of the officers. Fowler was disabled and Trist older and formally educated. They also disliked Captain Chapman and believed that his persecution of Newberg was an instance of petty tyranny. Fowler and Trist also differed from the other officers and that they were married. However, Nicholas Trist's marriage raised questions about his loyalty. When Trist wed the daughter of a Philadelphia innkeeper, Major Hamilton speculated that he intends becoming a patriotic American, as the anti-British sentiments of Trist's new in-laws were well known throughout the colonies. To be sure, neither Fowler nor Trist were tolerant of buggerers. Like the other officers, they had also heard stories of Newberg's sleeping arrangements, and both men treated the chaplain with skepticism when they first met. But as they got to know him, the two became impressed by his character. Whatever may or may not have happened in Ireland was of no concern to them because Newberg had proven himself to be an upstanding priest and a good friend. Accordingly, they ignored the rumors of buggery. Whether or not they were true was of no concern to them. Robert Newberg also presented an impressive closing argument. Having conceded that everyone thought him a buggerer, he pivoted toward an argument about rights and how personal preferences did not matter. He invoked the ideology and rhetoric of the Enlightenment to argue that how a man dressed and what he did in private should have no impact on his ability to do his job. In so doing, he came dangerously close to mouthing the same words as the men who would declare independence less than two years later. Newberg began his close by dismissing charges of perjury and falsehood as mere misunderstandings. He then refuted Private Gaffney's claim that he had seduced him into making unfounded charges against the captain. He insisted that his assistance of Gaffney was motivated by Christian charity, not sexual desire. I had always been taught that men by nature were entitled to equal rights and that it was my duty as a gentleman and a Christian to afford relief to distress whether I found it in a lord or a beggar, an officer or a soldier, he told the court. 
I was, I confess, deceived and disappointed. But as the chaplain to the regiment, it was his duty to help the less fortunate. Newbert also had to address the claims about his appearance. While Chapman asserted that he had the appearance of a macaroni, Newbert asked why this mattered. What clergyman war had been the subject of bitter debate in medieval times, but from the little acquaintance I had gained with the world in this age, I imagined all those old prejudices were exploded, and that man and ministers were judged of more by their principles and doctrines than their dress. So long as a man did good work, it did not matter what he looked like. Throughout his defense and his closing argument, Robert Newberg never argued that a man had the right to be a buggerer or that what a person did in bed was irrelevant. Nevertheless, his rhetoric anticipated the sexual liberalism of a later age. His mention of equal rights in reference to Gaffney suggests that he believed that there was a place for all men in society, not just the high and mighty. Likewise, his dismissal of those old prejudices indicates he believed himself to be in a more enlightened age when a man's appearance was irrelevant. He made all of these claims while standing accused of being a buggerer. Perhaps Robert Newbert understood the connection. Certainly his accusers did. Now, I won't tell you how the court-martial turned out because I want you to buy the book. <laughs> Rest, rest assured, there is a lot more homosexuality, revolution, and the trials of Robert Newberg in it than I can cover here today. But I don't want to end my talk without drawing some larger conclusions from the case. I think that the trials of Robert Newberg offer some answers to the questions of how people thought about homosexuality in revolutionary America and what they thought about it. On the one hand, the trials confirm our worst suspicions of the past as overflowing with hatred and homophobia. Thomas Batt thought that a rumor of buggery was sufficient for Newberg to lose his position, while Captain Chapman cited his appearance as proof of sexual desires. And this revulsion was felt widely. The most sympathetic responses came from Lieutenant Fowler and Ensign Trist, who just wanted to ignore the whole thing. On the other hand, there are other parts of the trials that subvert such a pessimistic view of the past. Newberg's response to the, the accusations against him is one of the most surprising. He faced his accusers openly, even though such actions only confirmed suspicions about his character. He also spoke of rights and equality at a time when such talk was deeply suspect in the British Army. The loyalty of Fowler and Trist is also remarkable. They knew the rumors about his sexual activities, but defended him anyway. I think that this dichotomy is completely reflective of homosexuality in the era of the American Revolution. Male-male intimacy was a controversial topic, and different people had different opinions about it. Some thought that buggerers should be put to death, and others laughed at them. Some ignored them, and others wondered if society might be more tolerant. This difference of opinion is not wholly foreign from our own time, such that I think that the 18th century views of homosexuality are more similar to the 21st century than we may think. The trials of Robert Newberg also offer us a new way to think about the American Revolution. I find it interesting how the officers' opinions of Newberg correlated to the impending division between Britain and its colonies. A month after Newberg's court-martial ended, several members of the 18th Regiment were deployed to Massachusetts, and many took part in the battles of Lexington and Concord. As the war proceeded, the men who had been the most determined to evict Newberg from the British Army led the charge to prevent American independence. Both Thomas Batt and Benjamin Chapman remained loyal to King George III as they sought to defend the British Empire from disintegration. By contrast, Newberg's staunchest defenders left the British Army and became citizens of the United States. Alexander Fowler worked for the Continental Congress during the war and later became a merchant in Pittsburgh. Nicholas Trist moved to Louisiana and began a plantation near Manchac. Both men were staunch Republicans. Fowler ran for Congress as a member of Thomas Jefferson's Democratic Republican Party, while Trist's wife Elizabeth was buried at Monticello in an unmarked grave. This divergence of loyalty matched opinions of homosexuality. The opinions of Batt and Chapman reflected a British approach, one steeped in scandal that connected a man's personal character to the fate of the empire. In such a worldview, a buggerer was a cause of disorder and had to be rooted out lest he pull down the natural order. By contrast, Fowler and Trist exhibited a more laissez-faire attitude. They could ignore men who had sex with men. A buggerer was less of a threat to the social order than an exacting captain 
or a tyrannical king. And I think that this correlation is the true le legacy of Robert Newburgh's trials for us today. The men who found themselves at odds with the British army with its persecution of Robert Newburgh helped to found a new nation. For them, buggery was something that did not disqualify a man from his position and by extension did not prohibit one from citizenship. Historians have argued that because the ideology of the American Revolution contained a commitment to individual rights and liberty, that the nation that followed always contained the seeds of abolitionism, feminism, and social equality. For this reason, we should not be so quick to dismiss the revolutionary potential of Newburgh's trials. Perhaps as with race and gender, we can appreciate the potential for inclusion of LGBTQ plus people that was inherent in the creation of the United States, even if full equality was delayed by two centuries. Thank you. I guess we're supposed to use these. Yes. <laughs> wow. You convinced me. <laughs> uh, we have time for a few questions. Dr. Tyler Putman is the master of ceremonies for this moment. I know we've probably had a couple of questions from Zoom as well, and we want to be uh, able to share those. And Yeah, we're, we yeah. just have time for one question from the live audience and then one question on Zoom, but then Dr. McCurdy is going to be signing books, and I'm sure would love to have uh, many <laughs> conversations. So I'm going to hand the microphone to Sydney. Hi, thank you so much. I actually got your book a couple days ago and have read it. Um, it's a really good read. It almost reads like fiction. Highly recommend. Um, so reading it, though, I found that a number of the people accused ended up being of people of a lower class than Newberg himself. So while I absolutely love to try and get more queer figures in history and people whom we might not have assumed, how much of Newberg's trial wasn't really about the homosexuality as much as his sort of um, counter to conventional norms. Like, had his partners been of the same or an upper class, do you think that people would have really cared? Or even if Newberg was lower class himself, of people with similar class positions, would it have been a deal? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question and a really good point. That, of course, I mean, this is a very privileged man, right? Uh, he's, he's more privileged and, and more educated than even the other officers in the regiment. And he uses that to, he knows how to respond uh, to this. And yes, uh, we know that other men are, and women who are accused of similar things, right? They don't, they're not a, accorded this type of, of, uh, of defense. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there are certainly things going on, uh, to your other point. Uh, some of this is about what he's accused of doing, and some of this is he just becomes a pain in the ass, right? Uh, uh, they, they all just want him to go home. Uh, you know, just stop being such a bother. Stop these court martials, stop, stop these lawsuits, which, which again, I, I like because this means all this stuff gets written down. <laughs> we have all this interesting uh, stuff to work with. But, uh, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, there, there are other issues going on, certainly, uh, that I think correlate, and I, and I think that's where I concluded with this, that uh, it's very difficult to, to disentangle the accusations of what he has done with his servant from the other aspects of his character, his litigiousness, uh, his fussiness, even the fact that he's a chaplain uh, in the army. Thank you. Um, some, a lot of great interest on Zoom as well, which suggests the online audience is just as engaged as our, our live folks. I'm going to consolidate a couple, but there's a lot of interest in how your work with students and with the public has informed your scholarship and vice versa. So maybe I'll just kind of merge a couple and say, uh, how is teaching the next generation of historians, undergraduates and graduate students, fed into your work, and how has this story uh, engaged them in the story of the revolution? Uh, yeah, the, 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 that's great. Um, I, think, I think, I mean, for me, I, I, the lesson that, that I learned, uh, which I hope I've been imparting to students, uh, is that uh, these really interesting stories exist in the archives, but you've got to go looking for them. Uh, I mean, and I think this is how I started, right? So I would have loved to have found this case 25 years ago uh, when, I was, when I was working on a dissertation, because then I would have had a dissertation. Uh, but, but it's only through digging through this stuff. It's only through digging uh, boring cases, uh, looking through pieces that you, you find these little bits and nuggets, um, which that's a hard lesson to tell uh, and a hard lesson to teach, right? Uh, you've got to keep reading, you've got to keep digging, you've got to keep looking, uh, and then be creative. Uh, but then hopefully the, the lesson that I, that I take from this that I hope other people take is, but there are these stories in there 
Uh, right, so people knew about these trials. Uh, 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 Scott and I were having this conversation about, you know, going through these old court martial records and looking for stuff, trying to connect this to, to research. And uh, they're there, they're known about, but you've got to be creative with them. You've got to ask new questions about them. People had written about, have written about the 18th Regiment before, uh, and Robert Newberg was largely uh, was like, eh, he's not that interesting, or he's a troublemaker. And it's like, no, there's something really interesting here uh, if you can just put that story together. And as is our tradition, we'll let Scott Stevenson have the final question the before time, the book signing. Only time in my life I get the final word, um, or at least the final question. Um, John, because we are, we work in public history here. We're you know next year we'll be celebrating our eighth anniversary. We're looking forward to 2026 and the 250th of uh, the Declaration of Independence. Um, the museum was really founded to tell a broader and more inclusive story of the American Revolution than you know we would have seen 25 or 50 years ago, or certainly 100 years ago. I appreciate that you've been a, a visitor here several times before. I just, as you reflect on the conversations you're having with the sort of rising generations, and you think about um, the nation where history is sort of seems to be both a source of deep division, but maybe also uh, uh, bring the possibility of healing and redemption. Do you just have any aspirations, thoughts about um, what you hope we'll be talking about in 2027 on the back side of that? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I don't know. I, I, we're working on this for a while, and I'm, I'm, still very, uh, I'm still very bully on the American Revolution. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential there, and I think there's a lot of criticism of the revolution, of what it did or didn't do, could have done, and I think that's all very fitting. At the same time, I think there's still a great deal of hope uh, that, that, that the ideals that, that come from the revolution do matter, uh, right? The idea of liberty, of, of individual rights, uh, of equal rights. Uh, and I think there are ways we can connect these to people living today, right? This is our legacy as the revolution. Uh, the 250th is actually a, a time of celebration of those ideals. Uh, even at the same time, we say uh, they weren't all achieved. Uh, today, even all of them aren't being achieved, but those ideals remain, uh, remain steadfast. Fantastic, thank you. Well, please join me in a warm thank you for... John Gilbert McCurdy. Mc